All right, we have the recording going on now. And let me see if I can again enlarge the screen where I can see all of you. And it's not letting me do it. Just bear with me here as I try to get this done. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Isn't it exciting when you try something new? Okay, okay. I'm Sam myself, so if you find some tricks where you can see everybody and have a presentation, let me know, because it's hard. Okay, yeah, okay, I can see everybody and I can see, I think I can see the PowerPoint as it goes. So let's give that a try. Um, Okay, do you see a map on your screen that says Judea? Yeah. Do you? Okay, okay. All right, then let's get into it here. Last time we began looking at the geography of Palestine. We followed the life of Christ from Bethlehem, which is really in Judea, down near uh, Jerusalem. And then we went up to Galilee. We went to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, we are coming down now to Judea, where Jerusalem is. And it's in the lower part of Israel. And at that time, there was a territory below that called Idumea. Uh, this is a picture of the Dead Sea. And it is dead. It, is, um, it has no outlet. So the Jordan River flows into it and uh, nothing flows out. So it is very dense with minerals. I guess those minerals are really good because women uh, get uh, makeup to put on their face made out of Dead Sea uh, minerals. Um, and you've probably heard of people floating on the Dead Sea you really can. I've done it. I, I yes. had to do the tourist thing and, uh, and do that. Um, but this is a, a shot of it. Notice the desolate area on this side of it. That all there is very arid desert. Here's another shot of the Dead Sea and another. Now we're going to show you pictures of the Judean wilderness. Remember, Jesus went to the Judean wilderness to be tempted of Satan. When he went there, this is probably the kind of area that he went to. Uh, this is looking down from the fortress of Masada. If you look at that, that picture, you'll see that there's hardly anything living there, hardly any vegetation. Down in the dry riverbeds, you'll see a few bushes, but that's all. And uh, when Dickie and I went there, she said, you know, when it tells about Jesus being tempted to turn the stones into bread, uh, she realized there are a lot of stones there to turn into bread. And, uh, and you can see, and I'll just show you a few pictures here of what the Judean desert looks like. Uh, notice here on your left, you will see a, a big square there on the mountain. That is a Roman encampment where the Roman soldiers encamped there to take the fortress of Masada. And this was one of their encampments. There are several there around that city of Masada. Again, another shot with the Dead Sea off in the distance. So maybe we can have a new appreciation of where Jesus went when he was tempted. John the Baptist also came from the desert area. 
and now we're going to go to Jerusalem. This is the view of Jerusalem, and uh, I remember when I first went there in 2010, it was quite a moving experience, being able to see the actual city of Jerusalem. That large building with the gold dome on there is the, uh, the Jewish mosque called the Dome of the Rock. Uh, excuse me, Muslim mosque. Thank you, Dickie. Dickie corrected me. <laughs> um, that is built where the Jewish temple used to be. And um, someday the Jews are hoping that temple is going to be rebuilt there, the third temple. A view of the Temple Mount here. Right in front of the wall that you see there in the middle, uh, this side of that is a Muslim cemetery. And then if you look way down at the bottom, that is a Jewish cemetery. And by the way, that was looking from uh, the uh, Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley to Jerusalem. Here we are on the Jerusalem side of the Kidron Valley. The hill right uh, in the middle there is the Mount of Olives. Over toward the left side is the Garden of Gethsemane. And several times I've tried to follow the footsteps that Jesus would have taken from the Garden of Gethsemane Simony, to the cross. Sir. And yes. Wow. Alan? Just going back maybe 2,000 years during the time of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, would we say that there would be many more like trees and vegetation during that time? Looking at this picture? I don't think Probably. so. Probably. I don't no. think so. No. Okay. Because... Uh, it, it is an arid area. So this is, would be the same way probably 2,000 years before, except for the houses? I believe so. Oh, yes. wow. Uh, it's very dry. Uh, you, you never see a house made of wood. Everything wow. is of blocks or bricks, stone. Wow. So, yes. Um, now, I've, I've tried to retrace Jesus' steps, and uh, I've tried it three times, two or three times, and uh, I think I'm getting a little closer every time. If you see that pathway down in the bottom of the valley there, I think that is probably the way Jesus walked. From the Garden of Gethsemane on the far hill down through there, down uh, past the uh, Pool of Siloam, and then into the city. This is the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, are any of you familiar with the Valley of Hinnom? Who can tell me anything about the Valley of Hinnom? Something happened in the Old Testament. <laughs> I'm trying to remember that. Something happened. Sorry. Yes. So it, yeah. This is Gehenna. Is this the place where, where, the where the, the uh, Jesus uh, done a, a miracle for? I mean, the, the I think they were the, the I think it was the the person who was uh, possessed, or is the one was it the demoniac the, the, uh, being set free? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. gathering. Okay, we, we've, we've gotten several uh, bit of input here. Okay, um, does the word Gehenna mean anything to you? Hell. Some, yeah, hell. Hades or hell. All right. Uh, this is the word is. that Jesus used to describe hell. Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom. In the Old Testament, it was a place of child sacrifice. That's it. That's, oh. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yes. um, the, the, one of the most evil yeah. kings, the, the son king. of Hezekiah. Yeah, he yeah. threw babies. 
Yes, and probably more than just once. It was, oh. uh, if you read the prophets, you see that they, um, wow. they decry human sacrifice, children sacrifice. It was done here in the Valley of Hinnom. It also was a dump that continually burned. And Jesus describes hell where the fire is, is never put out and the mm. worm never dies. So uh, you want to see hell? Look right there. there. Look right there. there. Uh, this last time that Dick and I were in Jerusalem, we wanted to go uh, around the uh, south west side and go and and find a certain location uh, but we couldn't do it we had in our gps but for some reason we couldn't find our way and we got sort of lost you know and so i guess you could say we were lost in hell because we were in the valley of hinnom um, thanks to the gps <laughs> <laughs> but we we made it out we made it uh, where we wanted to go so hallelujah <laughs> Amen. Amen. And okay, again, this is looking out to the Mount of Olives there in the far distance. And here we have the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, notice the olive trees. These trees are very old. Probably they weren't there when Jesus, excuse me, was there. But from the way I understand olive trees, these could be the descendants of those trees that were there when Jesus was there uh, because they regenerate. So even though a tree may look like it's dead, its roots can still be alive and it can regenerate. So these trees may indirectly go back to the time when Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this is a place that some people say is Calvary or Golgotha. Now, I don't believe that it is, but uh, it sort of looks like a skull, and Golgotha means the place of the skull. Calvary is a Latin word that actually doesn't appear in the New Testament, uh, except in the King James Version. Uh, the word is uh, cranion, which is, uh, you know, the word cranium referring to your head bone, skull, um, the place of the skull. The place is called the skull. And uh, we will look at a much more likely place for Golgotha uh, in a minute. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this has the most credible tradition that this is the place of Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Uh, of course, the Christians came in and built big churches over all of the great uh, sites there in uh, the New Testament in, in Palestine. And so they have built this church over the area of the uh, probably what was the the burial of Christ. Uh, you can go there and you can go into the church and you can see part of that original formation there. And um, if there is any truly Christian holy site, this would be it. It is regarded by both Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox uh, as a holy place. And um, I personally think that this probably is the place of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, this is another picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is the dome that is inside it. You know, I should be using my notes here. I just realized I'm not using my notes, but um, I guess I don't need it for this. 
Now, here is a map of the Roman world during the lifetime of Christ, during the first century. Uh, you'll notice that it surrounds the Mediterranean Sea. It goes as far east as Parthia. It goes as far west as the Atlantic Ocean and uh, England. In the north, we have the Danube River as one of the uh, boundaries on the top. And on the bottom, we have the Sahara Desert in Africa. This is the Roman world of that day. The Roman Empire's borders were the Atlantic Ocean, as I've said. And the Mediterranean Sea was a Roman lake. So the, the uh, group in power, the nation in power, is the Roman Empire under the uh, Roman Emperor. All right. Uh, do you have any questions or comments here? No questions or comments? All right. Now then, the trick is going to be going to the next PowerPoint. So let's try this. All right, it worked. The historical background. And this time I will put up my notes. Okay. So at this point, we're going to start looking at the historical background of the New Testament. Uh, and then we're going to look at the Jewish and then the Greco-Roman background. We need to understand this in order to understand the message of the New Testament. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of names and a lot of dates. Please don't be overwhelmed by the dates and the names that I'm going to give you, okay? It's not as bad as it may seem to be, all right? So let me just give you that assurance. But there is a lot that, uh, that will help us set the setting of uh, especially Jesus' ministry there in Palestine and uh, as well as other aspects of the New Testament. Now, when the Old Testament closes, the major world power is Persia under Darius. But as we open our New Testament, we see that now Rome is the world power. All right, it's not moving, is it? Okay, now we need to see what is going on here. Okay. Well, maybe it'll go now. Okay, so everything that happens in the New Testament happens against the background of the Roman Empire. Jesus was born at Bethlehem because of an enrollment called for by Caesar Augustus. Whether or not one should pay tribute to Rome was a living political and theological issue in Jesus' day. Jesus was sentenced to death by a Roman prefect. He was executed by a Roman form of execution. The Apostle Paul, the most important spreader of Christianity after Jesus himself, was a Roman citizen. The book of Acts is an account of how the gospel went from Jerusalem to Rome. When it ends, Paul is under house arrest under the surveillance of a Roman guard. In the book of Revelation, we see a Rome 
which has turned against the church and is savagely persecuting it. Now, you know from the Old Testament that Babylon conquered the state of Judah in 586 BC. Jerusalem, including the Jewish temple, was destroyed and much of the population was deported to Babylon. Now, the Jews who went to Babylon didn't abandon their Jewish faith. Even though they could no longer sacrifice in the temple, they studied the law and observed its teachings as much as possible. About 50 years after Babylon ended the Jewish state, Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon. And under Cyrus, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem, and in time, they rebuilt the Jewish temple in around 516. During this time, the three pillars of Judaism developed. The sacred writings, what we call the Old Testament, the synagogue, and rabbinism, that is the emergence of rabbis, teachers of the law. The priesthood, headed by the family of Zadok, who was the chief priest under David and Solomon, wielded the political power at this time in Palestine. So now Palestine is under Persia, and yet they are allowed to have their own government. Their rulers were the priests. So it was during this time that we see this dual power structure emerge. Now this kind of duality or trinity of power lasted uh, for many, many years through most of the time of the New Testament. The Persian era came to an abrupt end when Greece under Alexander the Great took over this whole territory. This was in the fourth century BC. In 334, Alexander defeated Persia. And in 332, he conquered Palestine. Now, Alexander's goal was to Hellenize or promote Greek culture in all the known world. The, uh, this process of Hellenization, that is, imposing Greek culture, is symbolized by five things which were brought to the conquered countries. First of all, the gymnasium. Uh, the gymnasium is a place uh, not of simply working out, you know, bodybuilding like we have today, but a place of education. There were the guilds, like trade unions. People from the same uh, occupation would get together. The stadium, athletics, which the Jews largely rejected because the games were done in the nude. Uh, the theater, which also the Jews largely rejected because a lot of it was really raunchy stuff. And most importantly, the Greek language. Well, Alexander did a complete job. And for the next 1,000 years, Greek culture prevailed throughout the Mediterranean world. When Alexander died in 323 BC at the age of 33, his empire was divided into five kingdoms each headed by one of his generals. And so here we have uh, the generals. Uh, Ptolemy ruled over Egypt and southern Syria. Antigonus ruled over northern Syria. Seleucus ruled over Babylon. Lysimachus was given Thrace and Western Asia Minor. 
and Cassander ruled over Macedonia and Greece. And here is a map of how it broke down. In 301, Seleucus defeated Antigonus and took control over his territory. So it was only four kingdoms. Let's just go back up here. So the one in the orange here defeated the one in the green. So he took over the area of Palestine. Okay. The most important empires for our purposes here are Ptolemy in Egypt, down here in the south, and that of Seleucus in Syria and Babylon. And we call that the Seleucid Empire. Now, Palestine was under the control of the Ptolemies of Egypt from 320, right at the beginning, to the beginning of the second century BC. In 198 BC, Palestine came under the control of the Seleucid Empire to the north. Now under both the Ptolemies and the Seleucid Empire, Palestine was given quite a bit of political autonomy. The country was under a foreign governor but Judea was considered a temple state. Its law was the law of Moses, and its rulers were the priests. The Ptolemies ruled in Palestine for 122 years. From 320 to 198 B.C. It was during this time that the Septuagint, the Greek version of the New Testament, uh, came into being in Egypt. Now, in 198 BC, the Seleucid Empire defeated the Egyptians and took control over Palestine under Antiochus III. Antiochus IV, or he's also called Antiochus Epiphanes, which means the manifest God, came to power in 175 BC. So this man, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, becomes a key player here during this time of history. He appointed as high priest the people who bribed him the most. The priest at that time was Onius III. He was a Zedekite priest. Now, remember what Zedekite means. It's from the family of Zadok, the priest under Solomon and David. Okay, That family line went all the way down to uh, Onius here. His brother Jason offered a bribe to uh, Antiochus in order to become the high priest. So Antiochus appointed him. Now Jason attempted to impose Greek culture upon the Jewish society. Now Menelaus, his brother who had just been high priest, offered a higher bribe to Antiochus. And so Antiochus got rid of Jason and made him high priest again. Jason and Menelaus, these were the last Zedekite high priests to serve. Now, it's interesting that during this time, the high priests are the ones who are promoting Greek culture among the Jewish people. The Greek culture was not compatible with Judaism, and yet they were promoting it 
among the Jewish people. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes moved against Egypt, but he was stopped by the Romans. Now, Jason was in exile, and he heard a rumor that Antiochus had been killed. And so he came back, moved in upon Jerusalem, and took control of it from his brother Menelaus. Now, Antiochus saw this as an act of rebellion, and he returned and he ransacked the city of Jerusalem. In 168 BC, he sent his army to stamp out Judaism. Okay, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. He sent his army to get rid of Jerusalem, get rid of Judaism in Jerusalem, carrying out the rite of circumcision, observing the Sabbath, and possessing the Jewish scriptures were punishable by death. Antiochus Epiphanes reinstated Manilaeus, and on December 31st, 167 BC, Antiochus plundered the temple, deliberately desecrating it, and established worship of himself. Now, the Jews reacted with horror at that. Now, imagine how the Jews felt when this uh, governor, this ruler, came in, had himself worshipped in the temple. Many of them denied the validity of Menelaus's priesthood. He converted the Jewish temple into a shrine of the Olympic Zeus. And he set an image of Zeus on the altar, and he offered a sow, uh, uh, a, a female pig, on the altar. For three years, this abomination of desolation, to use uh, Daniel's term, dominated the temple. So imagine what's going on here, how the Jewish temple is being desecrated. Now, during this time, a group of Jews who were zealous for the Jewish law and, and their traditions arose called the Hasideans or the pious ones. They later gave rise to the Pharisees. So at this time, we have the roots of the Pharisees coming to pass. In 167 BC, when the elder priest Mattathias in the city of Modin refused to obey the command to offer heathen sacrifices, he killed the king's agent and demolished his altar and the Maccabean revolt began. For a year, Mattathias led a group of vigilantes, guerrilla fighters, who fought against the Hellenism that had been imposed by the Syrians to the point of forcibly circumcising children. So they came back very zealous for Judaism. The Maccabean Revolt got its name from Judas Maccabeus. Uh, Maccabeus means the hammer. Mattathias' son, who became its first great leader after the death of Mattathias. Judas had quick military successes, and in 164 BC, Returned to Jerusalem to the ruler, returned Jerusalem to the rulership of the Jews. Exactly three years after the sow, <clears throat> sow was sacrificed on the altar, the temple was cleansed and rededicated. At that time, a new festival was commemorated called Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights 
or the Feast of Dedication, and this is mentioned in John 10, 22. Did you realize that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah? Uh, are, are you all familiar with the uh, Jewish celebration, the festival of Hanukkah? Any of you familiar with that? Okay. In America, there are three December uh, festivities. One is Christmas, of course, which Christians celebrate. Jews celebrate Hanukkah, and uh, Black people, African Americans, celebrate Kwanzaa. That is that is their uh, holiday celebration. So um, there is a tradition that during this time, the oil ran out for the lamps in the temple, and a miracle happened where the lamps kept burning for eight days without the oil. And that is where we get the Festival of Lights, or Hanukkah. Okay, the war continued. And in 160 BC, Judas was killed in battle. He was succeeded by his brother, Jonathan, who was high priest and who carried on the campaign from 160 to 142. Uh, Jonathan began rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. He was assassinated in 142, and then Simon succeeded him. Uh, this was another son of Mattathias, and Simon won independence for the Jewish state in 142 BC. Now, he was assassinated in 135. So with Simon, the Hasmonean dynasty began. For almost 80 years, the Jews enjoyed political independence. The only time they would experience that from the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 until the middle of the 20th century AD. Those 80 years there, starting with Simon. From Sir, the time, yes. So from the time of Mattathias to Judas Maccabeus, those were times of struggles by the Maccabean. Only by the time of Simon did they attain uh, independence uh, as the Hasmonean, uh, Hasmonean kingdom. That's right. So, okay. So there was a struggle from the one who started it and several leaders before they gained independence, right? That's right. Exactly you, right. Sir. Okay. Uh, from the time of the restoration of the temple, uh, there arose a religious division among the Jews. Those who supported the priests eventually became Sadducees. And those who supported the ruler priests were the Hasideans who eventually became known as the Pharisees. So the roots of the Sadducees and the Pharisees go all the way back to this time. Now, I'm going to be uh, mentioning the rulers that we're going to see rising, uh, but I want to skip down on the PowerPoint I want us to go here, and let me try to show you the order in which they go. Let's see if I can do this. Um, Okay, I'm going to bring you over to the side a little bit on my screen.
Okay. Uh, let me see then if I can do the annotation. Okay. Okay, uh, I've tried to put a one there by Mattathias. He is the first ruler. Secondly, we have Judas Maccabeus. Well, same thing is happening that happened the other day. It's trying to give me straight lines. I don't understand this. I even, I worked on this yesterday trying just to make sure that it was working right okay it's not so let, let me just tell you then uh mattathias is number one judas maccabeus is number two jonathan is number three there on the right hand side simon toward the left side is number four. And so that is the original Maccabean family. We then go down to number five is John Hyrcanus on the left. Then in the next line down, Aristobulus the first, first is sixth. Just to his right, Alexander Janaeus is seven. Alexander's uh, yes. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, if it is possible, you can um, point out with straight lines these names. Uh, they. <laughs> there is an option of um, a cursive, uh, cursive like the on the Zoom. If you can see there, cursive uh, option like. Well, I see draw and I see the, the wiggly line and that's what, yeah. that is what is selected. Okay. So I, I don't know what else to do. Okay. Okay. Um, so Alexander, uh, Alexandra Salome on the left there is number eight. Hyrcanus the second in the next line down is number nine. Aristobulus II, to his right, is number 10, and Antigonus Mattathias num is number 11, there on the next line down to the far right. So um, I wasn't too successful there, for which I apologize. I just don't understand why it's like that, but it is. Okay, so let me bring you back here where I can see all of you. Okay. Okay, then let me go back up to where we were. Okay. Okay. Well, hey, it's time for a break. So let us go ahead and take the break. And uh, hopefully this will all be straightened out before long. So have a good break and we will see you in 10 minutes.
All right. I'm trying to get the slide to advance here, which I don't know why it's not. Okay, well, it did. Um, okay, Simon's son, uh, John Hyrcanus, uh, succeeded him and became the, uh, the first Hasmonean ruler who was not from the original Maccabean family. Uh, Hyrcanus captured the area down south of Judea called Idumea. Now, little did he know that in a hundred years, a man from Idumea would succeed the last Hasmonean ruler on the throne of Israel. He also added Samaria and part of Galilee to his kingdom. Now, Hyrcanus sided with the uh, Sadducees and was opposed by the Pharisees. Remember, the Sadducees were for those who were in power. Uh, in terms of character, one person has called him an unprincipled vandal. Not a nice guy, in other words. Uh, John Hyrcanus was succeeded by his son, Aristobulus I, who ruled only one year. He was the first Hasmonean ruler to take the title of king, and he remained as high priest. Now, Aristobulus was paranoid. Do you, do you know what I mean by paranoid? He was always afraid somebody was out to get him always looking over his shoulder. Who's going to try to take my kingdom away from me? And this is something that we're going to see again and again and again, not only in the Jews, but also in the Romans. He had his brother Antigonus killed, and he imprisoned his mother, whom he also killed, and he imprisoned three other of his brothers. At the time of his death, Salome, his wife, hmm, I thought I had that on PowerPoint, uh, freed those whom um, uh, Hyrcanus, uh, excuse me, Aristobulus had, uh, had jailed. And uh, he was succeeded by his uh, oldest brother, Alexander Janaeus. Under Alexander Janaeus' leadership, the kingdom was greatly enlarged to the point that it had been when David and Solomon ruled. And here is the map of Israel under uh, Alexander Janaeus. And you can see it is uh, it's pretty much complete, including uh, Idumea at the bottom. But Alexander Janaeus exhausted the nation's wealth. He did that to establish his personal power and carry out his military conquests. His kingdom was torn with internal strife. 
uh, he was at odds with the Pharisees. He didn't get along with the Pharisees. And at one point, he had 800 of them crucified outside Jerusalem. He took their wives and children and had a big banquet. And he then killed the wives and children in front of those he crucified. And um, to say he wasn't a nice guy is to say the least. He later on uh, made amends with the Pharisees and changed his policy. At Alexander Janaeus's death in 76 BC, his wife Salome Alexandra succeeded him and she had a prosperous reign. She was a wise and prudent ruler. Now who says women can't have places of power, okay? She probably did a better job than any of the men. Now, since she couldn't serve as high priest, she had her son, Hyrcanus II, serve as high priest. When Salome Alexandra became ill and was apparent that she was approaching death, her son Aristobulus II took the initiative and threatened civil war if her favored son, Hyrcanus II, succeeded her. Now, Hyrcanus was not very ambitious or energetic, and after some fighting, he conceded to Aristobulus and let Aristobulus become king. Now, in reading Josephus about these guys, uh, Aristobulus seemed like the, the go-getter, and Hyrcanus seemed like he didn't really care very much, you know? If they had such things, he would rather stay home and play video games. But uh, so Aristobulus then uh, took over. But there was another person who would become a person of great influence here in the background. He enters the scene. He was an Idumean by the name of Antipater. Antipater. He had great ambitions. And he incited Hyrcanus II to try to take the throne away from Aristobulus. To settle the civil strife, the Romans intervened in 63 BC, and they ended up backing Hyrcanus II. At this time, the Roman general Pompey, <coughs> excuse me, did something that left an indelible mark on the Jewish people, something that no Gentile ruler had ever done. He entered not only the temple, but the Holy of Holies, and his trespass was never forgotten. When the Romans stepped in, Jewish independence came to an end. From then on, Palestine was under the domination of Rome. In 48 BC, Julius Caesar defeated Pompey. Julius Caesar appointed Antipater as procurator of Judea. Okay, he's the governor. Antipater, this man from Idumea down in the south. He reconfirmed Hyrcanus II as high priest and gave him the title of Ethnarch of the Jews. Not the more impressive title of king. Behind the scenes, Antipater was the real power behind the throne. In the meantime, Antipater appointed his son Phasiel as governor of Jerusalem and his son Herod as governor of Galilee. In 43 BC, Antipater was assassinated and his sons Phasiel 
and Herod took his place of control. In 40 BC, the Parthian armies moved in and from the, uh, from the east and captured Jerusalem, killing Phasiel and Hyrcanus. The Parthians put Antigonus II, the nephew of Hyrcanus, in power. So Hyrcanus and Antigonus go back and forth, back and forth, uh, depending on who is the power above them. And here is uh, sort of a chart of the, uh, the Hasmonean rulers. And we also have that here in this one that we looked at before. But in 37 BC, Herod, backed by Roman troops, recaptured Jerusalem and Antigonus was executed with the excuse me, with the death of Antigonus, the Hasmonean dynasty came to an end. Herod appointed Hananel as high priest. He was the first non-Hasmonean high priest since Simon uh, began the, uh, the revolt there uh, after the, uh, the Maccabean revolt. Uh, but even though a direct descendant of the Maccabees was no longer on the throne, Herod married into the Hasmonean family. He married Mariamna, Mariamne I, who was a daughter of Hyrcanus II, and so he married into the Hasmonean family. So at this point, Rome's base was in Syria, and they ruled Palestine through Herod. Uh, do you have questions or comments here before we go on? I know I've been giving you a lot of names, a lot of dates, uh, but I just want to set the setting for our understanding of the New Testament. Question, so when the, please. Yes. What is that? Question, please. Yes. Is there any connection between, because it, what I've heard is more like every, every uh, uh, what do you call, um, nation said happens was from after Alexander the Great defeated uh, the Persians. That's where it took, that's where the, the, the more like the actual of all these our kings comes along up to the point that now the Romans comes in. Is there any connections of the Romans to that, um, to the, the Alexandria thing? Like all these kings, like Matthias, whatever you, you mention it, is there any connection of the Romans to, to, to the to, to all these things, like as we start from Matthews, is it? I, I don't believe there's a direct connection. Okay. Now, uh, Alexander uh, ruled the world, and uh, at least from Greece to the east. Rome was in the west, and uh, Rome continued becoming a greater and greater power. All right. And so okay. eventually, uh, Rome uh, defeated the Greeks, and, mm -hmm. uh, and they ruled the world. Yeah. Sure. OK, I understand. Okay. Thanks. Uh, other questions or comments? Sir. Yes. Alvin. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier about Pompey coming to Jerusalem and then Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. um, we know that Rome was before a like a republic or something before it became under the emperors. So uh, Pompey and Julius were generals at that time in conflict with one another, is it? And then when Julius over defeated Pompey, that's when he really started to be the, the power for Rome. Is that is that correct? Um, when he defeated Pompey. 
like a turning point to become the the emperor okay the the first great emperor uh was uh octavian or is he oh, the son uh augustus yes augustus so it was it was augustus who was the first great roman emperor so it's like his father julius paved the way for for augustus to become great power later on that's right yeah. that's okay. right thank you yeah yeah there there was of course infighting there after the death of caesar uh, julius caesar and uh augustus octavian as he was known then uh was the winner yeah one more question please kevin yes in regards of mentioning the temple the, you're talking about the second temple hey that's right thank you right and we're going to talk about the temple uh perhaps next time but uh it was the temple that was rebuilt after the jews came back from persia and then uh herod rebuilt that rebuilt temple but uh, normally it's called the second temple some people Thank call you. it herod's temple and see three temples instead of two yeah okay let's go on okay it's not moving again there we go so herod managed to keep on good terms with the roman leaders during uh, this time, as they succeeded each other, uh, it's always helpful to pick the winners. Uh, Herod was a Hellenizer. He built great buildings, including palaces for himself, gymnasiums, baths, marketplaces, all the trappings of the Greek culture. But his greatest project was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. In 20 BC, he began dismantling and replacing parts of the existing temple. And since only priests could enter the holy place, he conscripted many priests to serve as construction workers. And they are the ones who rebuilt that part of the temple. But Herod's reign was marred by suspicion and fear. Here we come to that word again, paranoid, paranoid, paranoia. Um, again, he was afraid that people were going to overthrow him. He put to death his wife, Mary Omni I, his tie to the uh, Hasmoneans. He also put to death her mother, Alexandra, and her two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, as well as other relatives. He put to, to death several of his sons. And it was said that, uh, well, Herod kept the Jewish law. He kept the food laws so he would not eat pork. And it was said that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son because he wouldn't eat the pigs, but he would kill his sons. Why, why? That's funny. <laughs> uh, he was never really accepted by the Jews. And as the Jews came to seek a messianic figure, Herod became more uneasy. And this explains Matthew 2, 16 to 18, where it tells us that Herod had all the boys under two years old in Bethlehem killed because he was afraid that a ruler would rise from there. Uh, you know, the Magi came to uh, Jerusalem and they asked, where is he who is born King of the Jews? What was Herod's title? King of the Jews. And so he was desperately afraid that he would be replaced. When Herod's death approached, he had many of the leading Jews arrested, imprisoned, and he gave orders that they were to be killed on his death. That way, 
there would be mourning in Jerusalem instead of rejoicing because he knew that when he died, the Jewish people would rejoice. Well, fortunately, those captives were let go and not executed. So I'm sure there was great rejoicing when he died. Here is the sarcophagus of Herod the Great. Um, this is a place where his body was laid. Now, it's amazing that here we have the place where a biblical figure like this was actually laid. Uh, you can see this in the is Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. Sir, did they open? Did they open the sarcophagus? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, the the remains are there. And uh, no, I don't believe there's anything in it at this point. Yeah, I don't know if they've done DNA testing on it or not to see if there are any traces. Uh, in his fifth will, last will and testament, the fifth one, Herod had chosen Antipas to uh, succeed him as king of the Jews. But then he changed his mind, and in his sixth will, he appointed Archelaus over Samaria, Judea, and Idumea with the title king, and Antipas and Philip as tetrarchs. After Herod's death, both his son Archelaus and his son Antipas went to Rome to seek to uh, take the place of their father uh, and be called king. Augustus, the uh, Roman emperor, divided Herod's kingdom among his sons. And this is the way the, the map would look. Archelaus got the, uh, the sort of yellow part down in the lower section of Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. Antipas got Galilee and Perea. Galilee is right north of uh, Samaria there, and Perea is just to the right, just to the east. And then Philip got the area up in the northeast side. Let's look at each of them briefly. Let's look at Herod Antipas. He reigned from 4 BC until 39 AD, and he ruled over Galilee. Now, Herod Antipas is simply called Herod in the New Testament. He was a lot like his father. He was a great builder, but unfortunately, he also had his father's problems. Herod Antipas built the Sea of Tiberias, just on the east coast of the Sea of Galilee, named after the emperor Tiberius. He also built the city of Sepphoris, which was about four kilometers north of uh, Nazareth, both great Greek cities. Now, here I would like to say a word about the word Herod in the New Testament. There are three different people in the New Testament who are called Herod. First of all, we have Herod the Great, and he was the Herod of the infancy narratives. So when Jesus was born, that Herod is the one that we designate as Herod the Great. Secondly, there is Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great, uh, and he was also called Herod the Tetrarch. He appears in the Gospels after the infancy narratives and also in Acts 13.1. And then we have Agrippa I. He's also called Herod. He was the son of Aristobulus and the grandson of Herod the Great, and he's mentioned in, in Acts 12. Let me also mention 
oh, there it is, Herod Philip, who was the half-brother of Antipas, Archelaus, and Philip the Tetrarch. He was the first husband of Herodias, and we'll get to her in just a minute. He's mentioned in the New Testament, but it just calls him Philip. It doesn't call him Herod Philip. And we should also mention Agrippa II. He was the son of Agrippa I, and uh, he is not called Herod, but he is called King Agrippa in Acts 25 and 26. All right, let's go back to Antipas. Uh, Antipas was married to a lady by the name of uh, Phasilus, and she was the daughter of Eretus, the Nabataean king. Let me go back up to that map. Notice on the right-hand side, just right of Perea, it says Nabataeans, okay? Uh, Herod Antipas was married to the daughter of the king of the Nabataeans. Okay, so there was this connection between the Nabataeans and Galilee, Perea. Okay, while he was in Rome, Antipas fell in love with Herodias. She had been the wife of two of Antipas's brothers, and she was currently the wife of Herod Philip. She divorced Herod Philip, and uh, Antipas divorced the wife or the daughter of the king of the Nabataeans. So they both divorced their spouses and they married. Now, the whole scenario was really offensive to the Jews, and it really stirred them up. John the Baptist condemned Antipas, and Herodias made sure that he was executed. And you remember the story of how this happened. Uh, Herod Antipas gave a, a banquet for the leaders of his country, and uh, Herodias's daughter, Salome, danced for him, and he so enjoyed the dance that he told her that he would give anything she wanted up to half of her, his kingdom. She asked her mother what she should ask for, and Herodias now got her chance. She said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Well, she did, and she was given the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So John the Baptist was beheaded. Uh, much we are told to um, Herod Antipas's dismay because he liked to talk to John. Uh, and so John, uh, the, uh, John the Baptist was uh, beheaded because of this. Now, the Jews didn't appreciate what Antipas did and neither did the father of his former wife, the king of the Nabataeans by the name of Eretus. He declared war against Herod's tetrarchy and he eventually defeated Herod in the year 36 AD. When Herod Antipas heard of Jesus, he thought it was John the Baptist come back to life. And we also have this account in Luke 13, 31 and 32. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal go tell that fox. So Jesus calls Herod Antipas a fox. Now, a fox has a reputation for being very smart. 
very cunning and very sly. Um, and you know something? Foxes eat chickens. Shortly after this, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You see, Jesus protects the chicks. Herod Antipas eats the chicks. We also have the following account of uh, Jesus' trial before Herod. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. When Herod and his soldiers ridiculed, oh, then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. So Jesus goes before Herod. And what is Herod's attitude? It is mocking. He is not sincere before Jesus. He wants to see Jesus perform some miracle, you know, like a magician. And in the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, it has a scene where Jesus is before Herod. And I think it depicts fairly well what it was probably like. Showing a Herod that is not sincere, he is flippant, he is uh, mocking, you know, and in Jesus Christ Superstar, it says, uh, he says to Jesus, prove to me that you're no fool, walk across my swimming pool, um, feed my household with this bread, you can do it on your head. And that's probably, probably pretty well shows Antipas's real attitude toward Jesus. Now, eventually, Antipas, Antipas was banished to Lyon in France uh, by the Emperor Caligula, and Agrippa I, uh, the brother of Herodias, took his place as Tetrarch of Galilee. So do you have questions or comments here before we go on? Now, I want you to feel free to ask any questions uh, that you have uh, without being called on, okay? All right. Let's go on to Philip the Tetrarch. Uh, he ruled from 4 BC to AD 34 over Aronitus, Triconitus, Galanitus and Batanea. Now, Philip was given the title Tetrarch, which means ruler over one fourth. Under the Romans, if uh, a person ruled over part of a province, he was called a Tetrarch. Now, Philip was a quiet and responsible ruler. He rebuilt the city of Pontius and renamed it Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea after Caesar, and Philippi after himself. He married Salome, Herodias's daughter, who danced before Herod Antipas. When he died in AD 34, his tetrarchy was put under the uh, Roman leader from Syria, and then in AD 37, it was given to Agrippa I, again, the brother of Herodias. And then we have Archelaus, who ruled from 4 BC only to 6 AD. 
He ruled over uh, Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Now, Archelaus sought the title of king from the Romans, but he was given the title of ethnarch, which means ruler of the people. It had a little more prestige than tetrarch, but not the prestige of king. Archelaus was an oppressive ruler. His ferociousness made Emperor Augustus remove him from office to avoid a widespread revolt. Archelaus was banished to Vienne, a city in southwest France. Now, the character of Archelaus can be seen from Matthew 2.22, where it says, But when Joseph, who is in Egypt, heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod the Great, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Now, after Archelaus was banished in 86, Rome made Judea a Roman province under the jurisdiction of a prefect. Okay? So, eventually, all three of Herod's sons are taken out of office. So we've seen that Philip the Tetrarch's territory was given to Agrippa the first in AD 37. Then Herod Antipas's area was given to him. In AD 37, Judea, which was under the rule of the Roman prefect, was also put under Agrippa I, so that he ruled over the same territory that his grandfather, Herod the Great, had ruled over. Okay, so we have the rule of Herod the Great, then divided under his sons, and then united again under his grandson. Agrippa I was a strict Jew and a persecutor of Christianity. He executed James, the brother of John, and he would have executed Peter if God had not miraculously released Peter from prison. Agrippa died suddenly, and the early church saw it as the judgment of God, and it's recorded here in Luke 12, 19-23. Then Herod, Herod Agrippa I, went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is a voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Uh, Josephus also records the death of uh, of uh, Herod here. Now, after the death of Herod uh, I in AD 44, Judea went back under the control of Roman procurators and prefects. His son Agrippa II ruled some of the outlining territories, but he was only a minor player. Okay, questions, comments here? Just a note, sir. Uh, it yes. seems from your lecture that from here, the great to the three sons and Agrippa one, uh, they seem to be real kings, but like vassal kings only to the emperor. The emperor, whenever he chooses, has the right to remove them or replace them. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. They, 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 they again have that dual rulership. Hmm. Rome is really in charge. 
Roma's but he rules through these underlings. Would you say that this is the same pattern that uh, Rome or the emperors do with the other nations under the Roman Empire? They have their own kings, little kings like the Herods, but the real empire is under the Roman emperor. Uh, that's right. And now if they are actual Roman provinces, uh, they have either a uh, prefect. Prefect. Uh, yeah. Um, in this kind of outlying area, they have prefects. And this comes under the direct rulership of the Roman emperor. There were also senatorial provinces. Um, and uh, they were under the Senate. But where it was more unruly and there may be revolutions, it's mm. under, under the emperor himself. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, let's look at some of the prefects. Uh, most of the prefects of Judea are not mentioned in the Bible. The most well-known of the prefects is Pontius Pilate. Now, when you read the books about Pilate, he's sometimes called a procurator. He's sometimes called a prefect. So which is it, you know? Uh, the term prefect was changed to procurator under Emperor Claudius in AD 41. Um, and lest there should be any doubt about Pilate's title, it was resolved when an inscription was found in Caesarea that mentions Pilate and calls him a prefect. And here is the, uh, the Pilate inscription. The original of this is found in Jerusalem in the uh, Israel uh, Museum, but there is a replica of this in Caesarea. And originally it read in part, building in honor of Tiberius, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. So Pilate definitely was a prefect. Now, even the experts get this wrong at times. Where this uh, inscription is in the uh, Israeli Museum, it says Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea. Now that is wrong, okay? I will correct the Israeli Museum. Pilate didn't get uh, along well with the Jews. His administration was corrupt, and it was, he was guilty of excessive violence against the Jewish people. He did several things that were offensive to the Jews, <coughs> such as bringing Roman standards into Jerusalem. The standards were long poles <coughs> that the soldiers carried. Probably they had the Roman eagle on the top. In response, the Jews rioted, and Pilate had to remove the standards. He also brought shields into uh, the, uh, the palace there. The shields bore the image of Tiberius and probably proclaimed him to be God. Again, because of the offense to the Jews, Pilate had to remove the shields. Luke 10, uh, excuse me, Luke 13, 1 tells of some Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. Uh, we aren't given the details, but probably what happened here is that Jews were in the temple making sacrifice, and Pilate sent in troops and slaughtered them and mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices. Eventually, uh, things caught up with Pilate, the corruption of his administration, and he was recalled to answer to Tiberius. However, Tiberius died before Pilate got back to him, and uh, we hear no more of Pilate. Okay, we will stop here. Our time is up. God bless you, and we will see you on Friday morning, Baguio time. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, classmates. God bless, classmates. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Dr. God Gallen. God bless you. Bye for now. Bye for now, Pastor Gallen.